Hi everyone, Curtis here from Goth Rider Creations and today will be the second episode in our mini-series of how to make your own resin fretboards. Stay tuned! So, here we are for episode two, finally. Um, <laughs> I'd like to apologise to everyone for how long it's been. It's been nearly a year, um, but if you're a regular to my channel you'll know it's been a slightly entertaining year, so <laughs> um, if you haven't already seen the first episode, I will link to the end of this episode and I'll put a link in the description. Um, probably be worth looking at that one first and then coming back to this one. I don't want to send anyone away from this episode, but um, it really does sort of run concurrently on how to do everything. So the first episode was how to make your cheap and simple moulds. Today's episode is going to be how to actually deal with the resins, colour the resins, mix the resins properly, all of your PPE, and then how we actually get started. So, let's get started. Now, first up, a little bit of housekeep. Um, I have sorted out and sort of finalised the moulds I made last time. Um, I have a picture frame that I bought from the charity shop for £1 and uh, it is pretty much what we need. It is 53 centimeters long. It's about 15 centimeters wide. We also have the side mold as well. Um, one thing that I didn't get to show you last time because I didn't have it. Obviously you've got your brown tape, which is brilliant for the mold release. Something I found that's even better is vinyl repair tape vinyl flooring repair tape um, it's not as easy to find as the brown tape i can think you can get it online there are a few places like uh, screw fix tool station i don't know if lowe's or somewhere like that in the U uh, us would have something similar uh, but vinyl ref uh, floor repair tape is amazing nothing sticks to it it's a bit more robust and a bit tougher than the brown tape so that is my big recommendation there um, so yes, I have mummified the mould in that. Um, I did extend the mould with a few strips of 10mm balsa wood just to get it up a little bit higher because it was only 6cm wide and I wanted to have a good 7cm thickness um, or at least width in the board. So we've done that. That's all ready to go. And we have our cheap and nasty mould. Again, I've used the same vinyl tape because it is a little bit more robust on the back. I've also reinforced the sides with a couple of strips of cardboard. So now it will actually hold its shape a little bit better. So that's our three moulds that you saw last time. So they're all ready to go. Now we can start work and we'll start with the PPE. So safety first. Um, what we're going to be using is laminating epoxy resin. Now it's not as dangerous as some chemicals you can use but you still need to be careful. It is a noxious chemical. Um, it does release some fumes. Um, the ones I'm using doesn't release much at all. Um, it's not as bad as some of the industrial grade ones but you do need to make sure you've got some ventilation. I've got a window open across the room. Um, ideally if you can do it outside great um, but if you do have issues with being inside you do need a respirator now if you've got one of your lovely little dust masks don't bother waste of time um, it doesn't protect you against the fumes it will protect you against dust but not much else what you need to do is make sure now this is a cheap little Chinese knockoff one that I managed to get on uh, well, <laughs> wish basically, um, but I do know my masks, so I know this isn't too bad. Um, you need to make sure that you get a brown, at least a brown rated filter. Uh, if you go online, you can find the different grades. You've got greens, you've got blues, you've got different things that will protect you from different chemicals. Uh, this, I believe, is organic vapors, which is kind of the minimum you would want to use. Don't cheap out on your filters, get something decent. Uh, especially if you're spray painting using epoxies on a regular basis, things like that. It makes sense to have them. Um, the mask you can reuse for everything, even the one I just threw over there. Uh, you can just buy separate filters that, that go on them and have different abilities. So if you like the mask you have, go online, find out you know the make model and order replacement filters. You can literally just screw them off, screw them back on, done. 
Um, I bought this because it comes with a combination face shield, which is very useful. Um, you do want to have some form of eye protection. It's, it's like with any chemical, you don't want it in your eyes. The last thing you need is to be stumbling around half blind, trying to phone the paramedics to get someone down there. Not worth it, okay? Always have your eye protection. And with epoxy gloves, always with the gloves. Um, as a minimum, you're gonna want some latex or I prefer nitrile. A lot of people have allergies to latex these days. Uh, Summer Glau, if you're watching, I do apologize. I know you're not a fan of these. Um, but yeah, uh, those as a minimum for mixing because resin is, it gets everywhere. Um, you see people only wearing one glove and then suddenly they go to drop something, grab the other one and then <clears throat> waste of time. Yeah, you can buy these days for thankfully post-COVID, not many people are buying them anymore. So you can get them quite cheap. You can get a box of gloves for three or four pounds. Buy some, you will, you will always use them. So that's those. Um, with regards to the resins, it might sometimes be worthwhile getting some more heavy duty gloves. Uh, these actually came free with the pack of resin that I bought a couple of years ago, which was really nice of the company. Uh, obviously thinking of their customers. Um, it's not just the chemical. It's also the heat it produces. Epoxy resin, as it cures, has an exothermic reaction. And if you're not careful, if the temperature is too hot, and then you've got the curing of the resin, you can burn yourself. Um, there's also issues, which I will show later with comes to mixing. You need to have quite a large volume because the amount of heat it can produce in a small area, once it gets to that kind of reaction stage, between mixing and hardening, there's a kind of reaction stage, almost like a crystallization stage. At that point, the temperature can exceed water boiling point and get up to about 120, 130 degrees in some occasions, and that's easily enough to take the skin off your hands. So always make sure you've got the gloves, but we'll talk about temperatures later. So we've got our PPE, that's all sorted. We have also set up our desk. Uh, we've got the side camera here, we can see I've put down some cardboard and we've actually got some plastic. Um, I like using uh, rubble sacks. You can get them for you know, a roll of 10 for a couple of quid. Um, put one of those down. Um, it's always useful. Put the plastic down, put the cardboard down. If any of the resin does leak, most of it will be soaked up by the cardboard and then the plastic will stop the cardboard sticking to your desk. Okay you will spill some resin. It will always happen, <laughs> no matter how careful you are. So make sure you've prepared. So now that we've got the basics sorted, now let's talk about the resin. Right, so what we have here is laminating resin. Um, it's kind of the cheaper stuff that you can get. I bought this a couple of years ago as a backup for the other resin that I have, um, and I didn't use it. So I figured perfect for this. Um, I do prefer to use bioresins when I can. They are a little bit more expensive, but they are a lot better for the environment. Um, but we have this here, so we're just gonna use it. Um, when I say laminating resin, it's different from the deep pour stuff that you see people using for river tables on YouTube. Um, those ones are chemically designed, so you can pour you know, three inches, six inches, whatever you want in one go and it'd be fine. It's mostly the temperatures you need to worry about. Um, if you ever watch John Malecki, um, his channel, he does some crazy massive resin builds and he actually built himself a temperature controlled room specifically for the resins so he could pour it all safely. We're not gonna have access to that, so you've gotta be a bit more careful. Um, if you're going to do deep pour stuff, then go for it, buy the right stuff. We're only making fretboards here, so the maximum thickness we're gonna make these fretboards are eight millimeters. And instructions, always read the instructions. I know some guys, some people don't like reading instructions. If you're gonna do resin work, you gotta bite the bullet. If you don't read the instructions, it's your butt. That is as simple as that. Um, this stuff is very, very specific. Uh, each manufacturer has their own little recipe, their own little special sauce. Don't mess with it. 
read the instructions. It will tell you everything you need to know. It will tell you the ambient temperature in the room. It will tell you the specific details of what you are needing to pour it with, what materials it will work with, what temperature the room needs to be, what the mixing ratio is, by what type of mixing ratio. These are all important aspects. It's also in regards to humidity and working time. Okay, so temperature. Most resins like to work between sort of 10 and 25 degrees C. Ideally, you want to kind of be within 15 or 20 degrees C. Um, I'll do the calculations in Fahrenheit and I'll put it there. Um, but yeah, you want to be quite careful with temperature. Same again with humidity. Uh, resins do not react well with water. So if there's a lot of moisture in the air, that can also affect the curing times, make it lo take longer. So be careful of that as well. Height of summer, not the best place to be time to be doing resin. And same again, depths of winter, like I am at the moment, not the best time, hence why we're doing it inside. I've got the radiator set. We're basically at 15 degrees in this room. We're perfect. Now, it will tell you exactly what you need to know with regard to mixing ratios. Now, you will see a lot of people, John Malecki and the people like that on the internet, who just got big, massive tubs and they just pour a bit of that, a little bit of that, mix it up, done. It, it's not that simple. <laughs> the instructions will tell you exactly what you need to go by. When you're in the mixing cups, that's mixing by volume. These need to be mixed by weight. Okay, um, different resins have different viscosities. So one will be thicker than another and then the volume won't work. So if the manufacturer tells you to mix it by volume, get some measuring cups. If it tells you to mix it by weight, get some scales. It's that simple. Um, they know what they're talking about. They design this stuff. <laughs> if you go off book, there is no guarantees that anything will work. If you're really lucky, it will cure. If not, it will never cure, or it will go so hot it will crack into pieces, or you will end up with a river of epoxy all over the floor. Uh, it, it can happen, and it does happen to people quite regularly. So it tells you, this one is quite specific, uh, you mix in a mixing cup with a stirring rod. Okay, You can get certain resins where you can use mixing paddles. And these are simple little plastic paddles that you can mount to a drill like you see most people do online. Now, if it says that you can do that, then it's fine. A lot of these actually tell you that there is a speed at which you can mix. You know, 30 revolutions per minute, 700 revolutions per minute, whatever. If it tells you that it's got a half decent speed for mixing, Go for it. If it tells you to mix it with a stick and a cup, you mix it with a stick and a cup. Um, these things might look great for YouTube, but if you put four tons of air into that resin, then you're gonna get bubbles all over the place. So, we've got the details for mixing. It's got a specific ratio. This isn't as easy as some. A lot of them are two to one mixing, which does make life a lot easier. This is 100 grams to 47 grams. So that is quite specific. It's close to two to one, but not quite. So we will be using the scales and funnily enough, we will mix up 147 gram batches. So the maths is nice and easy. So that's what we're doing there. Intensively, intensively mix the resin and hardener for at least three minutes with a stirring rod. That you don't mess with. If it tells you to mix it for three minutes, mix it for four minutes. If it tells you to mix it for four minutes, mix it for five. Don't skimp on the mixing. You mix it and you mix it and you mix it and then when you think it's mixed, mix it some more. And then add your pigments or whatever you're going to do, then mix a little bit more, then pour. You, you, it's not worth having it streaky. Um, you will see when it comes to it, it does look quite streaky even though they're the same colour. One resin is a bit more viscous than the other. The hardener is usually a little bit thinner, so you will almost see it. It's almost like it's not quite oil and water, but you will see it as you're mixing it. It needs to be completely, utterly mixed. The sides, the bottom, everything. So don't skimp on that bit. So, got the resin, we've got the scales, we've got the uh, instructions. Now we get ready to mix.
Right, so we've got our scales, we know what weight we want. Then we need something to mix it in. Now, I have plenty of party plastic cups. Uh, I'm trying to move away from these because they're not exactly eco-friendly these days. Um, so I have been getting some nice little paper cups that you can mix into. Uh, if you're only doing small, tiny amounts of resin, spray paint caps or any spray, you know, oven cleaner, any kind of spray. The caps are amazing. They are small little receptacles and the resin does not stick to them. I'm not entirely sure what kind of plastic this is, but it doesn't stick. So if you're doing tiny amounts of resin, these are absolutely ideal. Once the resin is hardened, you can literally just bend the sides, crack the resin out, and you can reuse it. So those are an absolutely major top tip. Um, if the resin has issues with heat, if you are having to pour on a hot day, one of the ways to help is to use larger receptacles. Um, if you've got 100 mil of resin in this, because all of the resin is squashed in and compact, it will heat itself up a lot more and then you will have a reaction. If you have to pour or mix in hot temperatures, use just a wider beaker, not washing up bowl, but something wider, something deeper because then the resin will be spaced out a lot more, less likely of it overheating, less likely of it having a reaction. So another top tip, make sure you have a couple of large beakers you can use if heat is an issue. And one of the money saving tips, posh soup containers. They are also ideal for mixing resin. Um, same again, same kind of plastic, so you can just crack the resin out when it's done. So another money saving tip. From there, you need something to mix with, so you've obviously got your paddles if you can use them. If not, old school lolly sticks. Uh, you can get them from craft supply places, you can get them basically anywhere, or you can just save up your rice lollies from the summer. Um, these are ideal for doing this. You can use just a small piece of wood. You can pretty much use anything, but try and keep it as semi-disposable as possible so you're not spending too much money. And for what we're doing here, I'm also going to be brushing on some of the resin. So I went online and I bought a pack of tiny brushes. Um, they are actually synthetic grade, almost artist brushes. They're like tiny little decorators brushes. Um, these are ideal. You want to make sure that you've kind of washed them out first so there's no stray hairs. Stray hairs getting into resin is an absolute pain and it looks awful, so make sure you've gotten rid of any loose or stray hairs before you start. Um, but we'll be using that for at least one of the uh, moulds. And now we come to colourants. Now, with the denim ones we're doing, we could just go plain clear resin and done. Let the denim actually be the colour. But you've got many options out there these days. You could colour it with whatever you want, um, aesthetically and also for uses. So you've got things like mica powders, which are one of my favourites, and you've just got vibrant colours that you can just mix into your resin to give you some other options. Um, if you're using loose weave fabric like hessian or burlap or something like that, adding you know, some bright gold powder into that can really make it pop. Or if you go, con well, you don't get more contrast than that. You know, something like that could really make something like that pop. So these are definite options for something for you. If you want to be able to see through the resin more and you just want a tint, then you're going to want alcohol colorants. These are, ooh, really? these are tiny little bottles of alcohol ink. So these, you literally just put one or two drops, no more than that, into your resin and mix it up and then you can get a light blue color, a light yellow color, just a nice little tint to the resin. Because it isn't powder, it won't actually settle and it won't look cloudy. It will just give a nice little sort of opalescence to the resin. So if you want to hide what's going inside, then use mica powders. If you want to accentuate, then use these. Um, I will actually experiment with a tiny bit of blue 
in with the resin I'm doing with the denim just to accentuate out that colour. So that's another option. Um, you've also got slightly more exotic options. You can use metal powders. Um, you can use brass powders, you can use copper powders, a lot of those look really good. There's also an option for gilding. It's not technically gilding, but if you do a reverse mould, you can dust the back of the mould with a copper or a brass, then pour your resin, and then when you pull it out, you will have that uh, powder embedded on the outside layer and you can actually polish that up sometimes and it, it's almost like a fake brass a lot of props makers use that option for making horse fake horse brasses or fake metal equipment or tools or weapons so it's another interesting option and it's not just aesthetics you can also have useful options so what we have here is graphite powder um, I personally use this to make my own shielding paint, but if you mix this with resin, you can make your own nut blanks. Um, I believe there's a company called Graph Tech who started out making graphite infused resin nuts and it is self lubricating. It's what uh, locksmiths use to lubricate the inside of locks. Graphite powder is the same as what you get inside pencils, and this. It would have to be quite high quantities, but you could mix that in with your resin, make your own nut blanks and have your own self-lubricating nut blanks. So that is also another option. So it's definitely worth playing around with some of the options to go within the resin. And after all of that, I think it's time to get started. So what we will do is we will start with the glass. We have that all ready to go. Um, all I'm gonna do is Take our wax, because this is a new mold, quickly wax off this one off, and then we'll start mixing some resin and actually get a <laughs> fretboard done.
And that'll do it for that one. <laughs> um, put down the packers, put down the metal mine board. As you can see, I've weighted it down with all the heavy stuff I have to hand. And that'll do it. Um, there wasn't actually a massive amount of resin left, so I just flooded the top just to make sure there's enough to seep in. Um, with the weight I've got on here, hopefully it will actually push a little bit of that resin out so it really locks in. But yes, we will see how that looks in the morning and uh, we will get on with the next one. Morning everyone. So that's all sorted. And there we have it. And it seems to be <laughs> working okay. Now, I'm not gonna demold this now. We're gonna leave this for a few days. Uh, a lot of people make the mistake, they demold too early and it might be touch dry, like some of the drips might be touch dry and you think, oh, that's great. The central core will actually take some time to fully cure. Um, in my experience with these kind of laminations, it's anywhere between 48 hours and five days. Uh, again, depending on temperature, humidity, things like that. Um, now, if you pulled out of the mold now, it would just flop everywhere. It would be so malleable. Um, with every day you leave it, it gets harder and harder and harder. So we're, we're not going there. Uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so you leave it for a good three, four days ideally. Um, the other good thing to always check is your brush. If it won't come out of the pot, then you know you've got your, at least your initial tack is good enough. Just leave it. Um, the longer you leave it, the better it will be. Um, you see all these people, oh yeah, it's been 24 hours, let's crack it out of the button. It's not worth it. Um, so yeah, we're gonna put this to one side, we're gonna get the other ones done, and then in the third episode, I will show you the demolding, as well as how to actually get a decent finish on it. So let's put this to one side, and we'll get on with mold number two. Right, and here we are with mold number two. Um, all we're going to do is literally just lay the scraps in here. Similar procedure to how I did with the last mould. I'm just going to brush in a decent layer of resin in the bottom of the mould and then just lay up the individual strips, wet them out with the brush, add the next strips. This will take some time and the bottom layer of resin will probably start to cure before I get all the way to the top but I'm going to mix in small batches so it will literally be sort of 50 millilitres so in total it will be about 60-70 millilitres of resin that I will mix up each go and then that way that will probably get me maybe a centimetre of height per go as we go up. Um, not 100% sure but we're going to give that a go as long as I can get the next layer up before the resin starts to cure and starts to actually jellify, then it will be okay. I don't even know if jellify is a word, but we're working with it, so go with me, people. Um, um, and then we're just gonna get all the scraps laid up.
Okay, so that's layer one done. Um, that took up 74 grams of resin, if we were imprecise. Um, it just started to get tacky as I was putting that last layer on, so I think we're kind of in the right time range and the right amount of resin, so that is brilliant. Um, I've got just about two centimeters in height, so three quarters of an inch for my friends watching in black and white. Um, so yes, that is all sorted. The one thing I didn't show you guys, obviously, explained about all the resin and how to do it all. What about cleaning? Well, what you need are, oh, and excuse this tin, it's older than me, cellulose thinners. It stinks to all high heaven, but it will clean things off. Now, do yourself a favor. Get an empty metal or glass tin jar, whatever. Don't use plastic, cellulose will just chew through it and then you've got a puddle of it on the floor the next day. So I always keep these metal coffee cans just for such a thing. And it will clean off most of the drips, it will get any off of your hands, and it will also clean your brushes. But be very careful, um, if you leave the brush in the cellulose thinners, it will either eat the bristles if they're plastic or nylon, or it will eat the glue that holds the bristles into the head of the brush. And then you've got no more brush. So yeah, this stuff is quite substantial. Be careful with it. But it saves you having to throw away your brushes every time. So it's always useful to use in a pinch. Right, that's that. I'm going to go get some breakfast, come back and carry on. Right, that took a little bit longer than we expected. All I'm going to do now, I was just going to let it sit, but I do have a little piece of melamine. So what I'm going to do is glue this on, let the resin that's already splashed around the mold cure a little bit, and with a bit of hot glue, just seal up this mold complete. So then tomorrow I can come back in with the rest of the resin or some more resin, not that stuff, um, and then fill it up. And then that way, I'm not waiting for this to cure, go for the next one, it'll take too long. So let me just glue this in place and then we can do the last mold.
and there we have it. Um, I didn't really do a lot for that really. I'm sure you could see the first lot I just stuffed a load of the scraps into the resin, mixed it up and then realised I could barely pull it out of the cup. So after that it was a case of just empty the scraps into the bottom, even them up as much as possible, pour on a couple of cups of the resin and done. Um, this is probably the most wasteful way of doing it because obviously you're using a lot more resin than you need. And as I said in the first episode, if you do the whole squashing routine, you could probably get a lot of that resin out. But this is meant to be a throwaway mold anyway, so it's a bit more resin than I'd like to use. But you know, um, I think it will be an interesting look. I'm actually quite curious to see how that will come out. So yeah, the only surprising thing is, other than oh, I did spill a little bit of resin, it's actually really warm. Um, this has. It's the thermal reaction has come out quite impressive. You can just hold your hands above it and you can feel the radiating heat. Uh, I wish I had a thermometer to check exactly what the temperature is, but it's, it's kicking out quite a bit of heat, so it is quite substantial. Um, technically, with the thickness of this, it might be just over the 10 mil prescribed by the resin for its thickness, so that might be why I'm getting so much heat off of it. Um, I'm hoping that it's not much past that 10 mil that is gonna cause an issue, but with all of the fabric in there, it should absorb more of the resin and hopefully there won't be as much issues with cracking. But again, a complete experiment, so we will see how this does. And I think that'll do it. So we've got the three molds all done, all complete. Um, in the next episode we will actually demold them and then we'll see how all of the different uh, methods went with regards to the waxes and the mold releases. Um, and then I will actually show you how to trim them up, get them to a point where they are actually usable um, as complete blanks. Um, I won't go too crazy on all of them. What I will do is I will probably sand one of them so you can see the layers. Um, I will cut down another one just so you can see as it is as a complete blank. And then on the third one, I'll probably will do a polish on there. Not a crazy polish, but just enough that you can actually see the depth. So I think that will do it. Um, as usual, please uh, like, subscribe if you haven't already. Um, as I say, there will be another episode in this series. Um, and please throw us a comment and let us know what you think. Uh, if there's anything I've missed or anything you would like me to cover in a bit more detail, please let me know. I'm happy to go through any of the other details. And uh, I think that'll do it. Take care, everyone. I'll see you next time.